When did we switch that? It, right when you walked out when I started, it turned off. So I had to switch it. Oh, okay. So this is the first oh, hour. Oh, shit. Oh. Mm. Don't do that. Okay, you're right. So we, we didn't... Sorry, everybody. I didn't mean to say that. This is uh, the first hour? This here? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Well, there we go. Okay. The... Uh, Address again. The hour of the time, 101.1 FM, in care of P.O. Box 940, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925. That's the hour of the time, in care of 101.1 FM, P.O. Box 940, Eager, spelled E-A-G-A-R, Arizona, 85925. Once again, I want to apologize for what you may have just heard. Uh, Doyle forgot to uh, do the tape when I left, and it was time to do the tape, and uh, he thought he was whispering, forgetting that this mic picks up everything, and he was just expressing his anger with himself for having missed something that he was supposed to do. So I thoroughly and most humbly apologize. Do I? I and, apologize uh, also. Doyle feels pretty bad about it. I can tell you that right now. I can see by the look on his face. So, uh, okay, now we are going up to the uh, top of the second hour, and uh, during the uh, third hour, we're going to talk about the constitutional and legal basis for the freedom of speech, what it means, who has it, how it can be exercised, and uh, when and where, and uh, all that kind of stuff. Actually, we just... Uh, yeah. What we did is wiped out probably about the uh, first half hour <laughs> of the broadcast on the tape. If anybody orders tonight's uh, tape of tonight's broadcast, the uh, first half hour of the broadcast is actually going to be the commercials that you heard uh, Doyle doing, and then it picks up from there. It's no big thing, everybody. Okay, Doyle, you want to grab over there, and we'll put 101.1 FM back on the air. All right, got it. Okay, 101.1 FM is back on the air, for those of you listening in the Round Valley. And the reason we have to do that is because 101.1 FM is a nonprofit community service radio station. We cannot air commu uh, commercials on that station, nor do we wish to. Uh, nor does anybody want to hear them on that face. <laughs> so that's, that's the way that goes. What? Oh, okay. Well, we can't do that now. Oh, We're in the air. All right. That's fine. Uh, lost my train of thought. Okay, I'm getting back to it. Here we go. We're going to uh, talk about now the lawful or legal constitutional basis for the First Amendment in specific, because there's different parts to the first article in amendment, the freedom of speech, what we all know as the uh, freedom of speech. So uh, I want you all to pay very close attention and uh, make sure that you're, that you, uh, Understand this, because uh, it's it's uh, it's important. It is very important, ladies and gentlemen. More important than you can maybe even possibly uh, imagine. Let me see what this is. Okay. Okay. When the founding fathers came up with the Constitution, we'll talk about how they did that on some other night. Uh, and presented the Constitution to the several states as an addendum to the Articles of Confederation, which, despite what you may think or what you may have ever been told, were never, ever abolished or, or uh, thrown out or anything else. They were just simply not even addressed. But since they were formed in perpetuity, they are still a part of the law in this country. Anybody that tells you otherwise isn't playing with a full deck of cards. So, <clears throat> the states, when they got the copy of the Constitution, thought that, hey, boy, they've really given the government a lot more power than it ever had before, 
And we're not sure that this is good because the rights of the individuals may be in dire jeopardy because of this. You see, there's plenty of room here for this government to turn despotic, despotic, and become a tyrant. And uh, so we must have safeguards to ensure that that cannot and does not happen. So the states sent the Constitution back and said, we will not ratify or accept this document until these things are done. And so they were done. And uh, a lot of people don't know that there is a, a uh, preamble to the, to the uh, Bill of Rights. And nobody wants you to know that there's a preamble to the Bill of Rights because the preamble explains what the Bill of Rights are really for. And that's what they're afraid of. They're scared to death that you'll find out what the Bill of Rights are really for and why they were created by the Founding Fathers. And uh, it, uh, it really clarifies things like what the second article in amendment is really all about. Now, before I go any further, I want to do this so that I don't have to lose my train of thought again. You're listening to WBCQ, Monticello, Maine, USA. So, here it is. Congress of the United States, begun and held at the city of New York on Wednesday the 4th of March, 1789. Listen very carefully, ladies and gentlemen. This is the preamble to the Articles in Amendment to the Constitution. The conventions of a number of the states, having at the time of their adopting the Constitution, expressed a desire in order to prevent misconstruction or abuse of its powers of both houses concurring that the following articles be proposed to the legislatures of the several states as amendments to the Constitution of the United States all or any of which articles, when ratified by three-fourths of that said legislatures, to be, to all intents and purposes, as part of the said Constitution. Articles in addition to and amendment of the Constitution of the United States of America, proposed by Congress and ratified by the legislatures of the several states, pursuant to the fifth article of the original Constitution. Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg, Speaker of the House of Representatives, John Adams, Vice President of the United States and President of the Senate. Attest, John Beckley, Clerk of the House of Representatives, Sam A. Otis, Secretary of the Senate. So the Bill of Rights was actually signed by Frederick Augustus Muhlenberg and John Adams and was attested by John Beckley, Clerk of the House of Representatives, and Sam A. Otis, Secretary of the Senate, and all other signatures, regardless of what you told, were witnesses, not signers. Everybody understand that? I hope so. Okay. Tonight we're talking in particular about the First Amendment. The Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments ratified December 15th, 1791, First Amendment. And here it is. Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof or abridging the freedom of speech or of the press or the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. So what does it say there? It says specifically that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Now, those are the two main parts of what we call the freedom of speech. Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press, and then there's one that still covers freedom of speech but is not important as freedom of speech or of the press because it's included in those or of the right of the people peaceably to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances which is a form of freedom of speech 
Okay, now what does that say? It says Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. And that's what we are going to dwell upon. If Congress makes a law abridging the freedom of speech or the press, Congress has done an unconstitutional thing. Now, let me explain one thing to you. You see, this only applies within the states, ladies and gentlemen. You see, the Constitution also grants to Congress the power to legislate in all cases whatsoever within the 10 square mile area known as Washington, D.C., or the District of Columbia. Within that 10 mile square area, and within territories, insular possessions, on dockyards, forts, or upon property, which has been purchased by the federal government, and where jurisdiction has been ceded by the legislature in the state where the property has been purchased, the United States Congress may legislate in all cases whatsoever, which means they can make laws abridging anything they want to, but not within the states of the Union. That does not apply to citizens with a capital C. Okay? Now, what does it mean? It just means that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Does that mean that if someone has a newspaper and you want to make a statement to the community that you can go down and force the newspaper to print what you wish? 520-333-4578. Is that what it means? Can you do that? And if you can, why? And if you cannot, why not? How does that apply to the freedom of speech? I own a newspaper, a national newspaper. Many of you subscribe to it. The name of the newspaper is Veritas. That's Latin for truth. Can you come to me and give me an article and force me to print it under the first article in amendment, claiming your right to free speech? Can you do that? 520-333-4578. It's not a trick question, ladies and gentlemen. Just call me and let me know if you believe that you can do it or if you believe that you cannot. And if you believe that you can do it, why do you believe that you can do it? And why do you believe that I have to publish whatever it is that you have brought to me and asked me to publish? 520-333-4578 is the number. Boy, we had five million calls earlier this evening, and now it looks like we're not having any calls. So, what's going on here? Do you want me to give you the answer, ladies and gentlemen, or do you want to talk about this? You don't want to talk about it. Okay. I'll give you the answer. No, you cannot. And the reason that you cannot is because it's your freedom of speech that you're attempting to exercise, not mine. Well, I saw it ring. Did you? 520-333-4578. I saw the, the light flickering. So we may be having some telephone problems. I don't know. 520-333-4578. Keep trying. <laughs> we get a dial tone, which means the phone works. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, it's Dodo Head again. <laughs> You know, folks, in our history, we've had three poopy diapers, uh, whom we shall sometimes refer to as poopy diapers and sometimes as dodo heads. One is Kurt Lochner. Kurt Lochner, a monumental fraud, if I ever saw one. Another one is named Steve Livingston, and the third and final was Scott Scarborough. And uh, I think that we will probably be plagued by these dodo heads for the rest of our life. Good evening, you're on the air. You know, it's a rather annoying question. Do you know why? Why? Because I would think some, most of the people who listen to your show would know the answer to it, but most of the people walking around in a fog don't know. That's true. Because they think that it is the federal government that 
is the creator of the state governments, and if they were told that there was a state constitution, they would look at themselves silly because they don't even know that. No, they don't know it. They've never read it, don't know what it says, and don't know what it means. And it's a contract on the government. Yeah. By the way, it's Howard from Philadelphia. Okay. It's Welcome. Been years since <laughs> been on the air. Uh, also, when I opened the phones, I noticed that nobody was calling. And I, you know, whenever that happens, it's usually because people are not secure with their own thoughts on the subject. They're afraid that their answer is going to be wrong. Well, the answer, the, the, there's only one answer because uh, here's the thing that I've always found. When I used to, uh, I still carry a constitution around. Usually carry it in, in a bag or something. But good for you. I, when I say to people. Have you read the Constitution? Well, I don't have the time. And then I pull it out and I say, well, here it is. You don't have time to read that? And they're astonished. Well, that couldn't be it. I said, why couldn't it? Well, it would have to be longer than that. I said, no, it doesn't. They actually wrote things in those days so that the village idiot could understand it. Yes. Not read it, but certainly understand it. Uh huh. And it's short. And it's to the point. It's very short. As and, a matter of that's fact. That's right. And you know that Pennsylvania's Constitution is uh, probably one of the better ones out there because it's very to the point. Mm -hmm. Especially when it comes to abolishment of government, which nobody wants to talk about, but it's in the Pennsylvania Constitution. Yes. The people have the right to abolish the government as they see fit. And... They don't want you to know that, though. Well, they've been dismantling that Constitution. Uh, I'll talk about the Pennsylvania Constitution. They've been dismantling that Constitution since 68. Mm -hmm. And they've been piecemeal pulling pieces out of it every other year with constitutional ballot questions. They lie to the people at the ballot. When I go to vote, I ask them, where is your copy of the Pennsylvania Constitution? You have a ballot question on there. Well, the question's on the wall. I said, no, no, no. Where's the copy of the Constitution? Why don't you have a copy here for the people to read? How can they make a decision? And they've been dismantling the Constitution that way. Most people voted for a constitution, the last constitutional amendment that people voted for in overwhelming numbers was to make it so that children could be videotaped in court testimony. Except that was what they told people they were going to do in Pennsylvania. What they actually did was they said that you have a right to face your accuser face to face. And they took the words face to face out. That's all they needed to do. Uh -huh. Now, three years later, I find out that one police officer who was among five police officers can now testify what the other police officers saw in Pennsylvania. And this is what we get. Because you no longer have the right to face-to-face -to -face confrontation with your accusers. Well, that's exactly right. And you may very well face your accuser via videotape. Yeah. Closed-circuit television. We're seeing, we saw that with Clinton. Mm -hmm. You can uh, face your accuser by a, a number of means. And now... Cops who were at the arresting scene or whatever don't even have to show up so long as one of them who was there can recount what happened. Uh -huh. And he testifies for the rest of them. Okay. We're getting way off subject, though. How about the newspaper? How about it? Can you bring an article and demand that I publish it? Of course not. It's your newspaper. Okay. In, enforcing, in trying to enforce your right to freedom of speech, why can't... I want to stand you, outside your home outside the limits if I'm foolish enough to do that and free speech all I want that's one thing if uh, well, number one it's your newspaper it's not my newspaper ah. and you're the one with the right to print what you want that's exactly yeah. correct I'm not the one I have no right yes that's that's correct well you do have a right if you start your own newspaper that's right but I don't have a right to your newspaper no do you have a right to go on my property, even though I'm not there and don't know that you're there, and and uh, scream and yell and, and practice your freedom of speech? I have a right to stand on the edge of your property line. However, I believe that if my screaming and yelling annoys you as it travels across your property line, I have now infringed on your right. To peace and quiet and happiness and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, you know, walk yeah. the dog, play with the kids, that kind of stuff. Very good. Okay, you're absolutely 100% correct. Well, I would hope so. You are. <laughs> a lot of people out there would disagree with you. Well, uh, and, and a lot of people out there would be fools. Yes. Well, a lot of them, uh, unfortunately, are. Um, uh, but, you know, most of them aren't really fools. They're just ignorant. Well, I don't know. I, I think that there's a point where ignorance cannot be tolerated. Well, that we've passed that point, and that's 
you know, that's why I'm trying so desperately to wake people up and make them ask questions. Oh, we're, we're, we're absolutely past that point. Let me, can I get you off topic for a second? Uh, no, let's stick to this because we're in the last hour and we don't have too much time to go. So okay. why don't, why don't you uh, listen, listen for another evening and we'll, uh, you know, we'll touch on all these other things, I promise you. Okay. Okay? Thanks Good for night. calling. Thank you. Okay, he's absolutely correct, ladies and gentlemen. He cannot, cannot come and force me to publish his article in my newspaper because the newspaper is my property. I own it. In publishing the newspaper, I am not attempting in any way to give you freedom of speech. I am exercising my freedom of speech. And I can put whatever I want in that paper. I can take out whatever I want in that paper. If I'm an honest and ethical and moral person, I will try to put into my paper that which is true. And I will try to present it in a manner that helps the community, but it's not a requirement that I do that. I can, if I wish, publish nothing but lies. In exercising your freedoms, you can determine that you're not going to purchase my newspaper, and you're not going to read those lies if that is what I am publishing. You're not required to do it. How does one publisher, how does one publisher capture the entire audience of a city? Used to be in this nation, ladies and gentlemen, there were lots and lots of small, what you would call mom and pop newspapers everywhere. Small publications. Pamphleteers, they used to call them. And they proliferated everywhere. And uh, you're on the air, but hold please just for just a second. And uh, there was a plethora of ideas and journals and newspapers and books and all kinds of things to read from which to draw your knowledge or to choose the ideas and things that, that uh, you wanted to read. That doesn't happen anymore. In Phoenix, we have two newspapers, the Arizona Repulsive, and the other one, which is just as repulsive, but it's called something else. One pretends to represent the liberal view, and the other pretends to represent the conservative view, and they both present to you the same idea that you're supposed to believe, whether you're liberal or conservative, and both papers are owned by the same corporation. That has happened all throughout this country. So if you're looking for freedom of speech, in the establishment newspapers, you are going to find it. You're going to find the freedom of speech of the owner of the paper. And unless you seek other viewpoints and other newspapers and other avenues and other alternatives from which to draw ideas and philosophies and reporting and truth or untruth, you're never going to know what the truth really is. And so, where you think you have freedom of ideas, you may find that your ideas within this realm of freedom of speech are being directed by certain agendas into certain paths. And once you get into those paths, it's very hard to get out of it. Good evening. You're on the air. Hi, Bill. This is uh, Dan from Indiana. Hi, Dan. And this kind of reminds me of, uh, the, well, there's obviously a radio station, WCCR, stands for Worldwide Christian Radio. Uh-huh. I don't know how it was started. I assume there was somebody who wanted to put a Christian message out. Anyway, about a year or a year and a half ago, uh, they gave airtime to a show to a guy who purported to speak for the Antichrist. And I guess they... they well, he said he was the Antichrist. Right, well, 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 maybe he was. I, I, I don't know. But <laughs> the thing is, I assume that the, uh, the, sh the radio station did this in the interest of, you know, fair play and trying to give voice to the side. But theoretically, I mean, since they sell airtime... Actually, I think they did it for $250 an hour. I don't know what it was, but, but just the point that now somebody, I, I, I don't know who it was, but somebody started this radio station to put out a certain message, and theoretically, if they're just going to sell to anyone, no matter what they say, somebody, you know, maybe it was me, started this radio station to put out a Christian message, and all of a sudden, I'm forced to sell to the highest bidder, maybe, and all of a sudden, my dream, you know, whether it's right or wrong, is being subverted, because now I'm being forced forced to put out a message which was not my goal in the first place. Uh -huh. The idea that maybe it's not just this one show, but maybe 24 hours a day of my broadcast, I am sort of forced to 
to give message to this view just because there are people who have money to pay for this. Yeah, but you're, you're not forced. It's ultimately your choice. You can either do it or choose not to do it. Or you can go out of the radio business and go into some other business if it's not lucrative for you. Well, well, well it's, just, it's just the idea. If I started this station and for a, a particular purpose, I mean, it's, you know, I put the money up. It, you know, it's my investment. I wanted to put something out, and uh, it's mine. Yes. You know, and, and, and so just because... That doesn't mean it's going to succeed. No, no, of course not. But, but it's, it's the idea that... Uh, you know, just because uh, a bunch of people who want to put out an anti-Christian message, they should be able to sub subvert my, my intent. You know, it, it's... Well, they're not subverting your intent if they apply it to you for airtime and you grant it to them. Oh, right, yeah. Uh, yeah you I, have, I you have subverted yourself. All they're doing is exercising their freedom of speech. They got a contract from you. You agreed to accept so much money and give them so much airtime, and they're just doing what they they have a right to do under those conditions. Yeah, absolutely, but uh, uh, if, it, if it's you know my sort of thing that I set up, uh, uh, I can only assume it was in the interest of fairness, trying to give a voice to the other side or something that, that they did this. But uh, the bottom line, uh, if they have people 24 hours a day that want to broadcast an anti-Christ message, it's like, hey, that, you know, that's not what I'm about. It's not what I set this up for, and I'm not going to give you airtime, period. I'm not going to sell it to you. you know, I'll sell it to a... Well, if it was me and something was called Worldwide Christian Radio that was broadcasting exactly the opposite of what those words mean, I would say that there is an agenda there to sucker Christians in to listen to something that maybe they would not ordinarily listen to simply because of the name Worldwide Christian Radio. Oh, sure. Well, th there's no doubt that so much Christian broadcast. And by the way, folks, we are in no way criticizing WWCR. He only used one example, and we're just sort of, you know, going with this example. Well, that's just sort of a, a, a real life... But what is your point? You, you're going around in circles, and you, you don't seem to have any point. Well, Anybody's my, free to start a business. My, if, it, if it doesn't succeed, that it has nothing to do with anything that we're talking about. My, well, I'm just saying, my point is that uh, if, if that had been my station and that, that was the scenario, uh, if I don't want to put people with a certain viewpoint on the air, I don't have to, period. That, you're absolutely correct. It's your property. You don't have to put them on the air. You don't have to even entertain putting them on the air. And if they're on the air and they displease you, you can remove them from the air within within the restrictions of the contract. Sure. And if you violate the contract in kicking them off the air, you might find yourself in a lawsuit and having to pay them a lot of money or something. Yeah, but it's it, it, you know, just the basic thing. of it, it, It's another thing of uh, shouting fire in a crowded theater uh, to me. Well, that you know, that doesn't pertain to private. That's your choice whether you allow somebody to, to be on your radio station or not. You're absolutely correct about that. All right, thanks, Bill. You're welcome. Let's uh, let's look at this because a lot of people have a, a misunderstanding of what freedom is. Let's let's look at the definition of the word free. It means, and this is from uh, from uh, where is it from? <laughs> This is from the law, Dick Black's law. Okay, here we go. Being at liberty, not being under necessity and restraint, physical or moral, a word of general application to the body, the will or mind, and to corporations. Two, in government, not enslaved, not in a state of vassalage or dependence subject only to fixed laws, made by consent and to a regular administration of such laws, not subject to the arbitrary will of a sovereign or lord, as a free state, nation, or people. Three, instituted by a free people, or by consent or choice of those who are to be subjects, and securing private rights and privileges by fixed laws and principles, not arbitrary or despotic as a free constitution or government. Four, not imprisoned, confined, or under arrest as the prisoner is set free. Five, unconstrained, unrestrained, not under compulsion or control. A man is free to pursue his own choice. He enjoys free will. I'm sorry, folks, that wasn't Black's. That's uh, Webster's 1828 Dictionary, which is where most definitions of words come from in the law. If you want to understand what the Founding Fathers 
meant by a certain word, you must obtain Webster's 1828 Dictionary because some of these words have been intentionally changed over the years. Other word definitions are changed due to popular use, and uh, so on and so forth. Let's look at freedom, and this is from Bouvier's uh, Law Dictionary, 8th edition, 1959. Freedom is liberty, the right to do what is not forbidden by law. Did you hear that? Liberty, the right to do what is not forbidden by law. Freedom does not preclude the idea of subjection to law. Indeed, it presupposes the existence of some legislative provision, the observance of which ensures freedom to us by securing the like observance from others. Okay. What that means, ladies and gentlemen, basically, is that societies, free societies, if you will, since we're talking about freedom and the word free and free speech, decide by contract. In this case, in a constitutional republic, the Constitution for the United States of America. What the law is going to be, and all agree to live by and under and within that law. So we have responsibilities to obey the law in our activities, in our exercise of our rights and freedoms. We must remain within the law. But it also limits government and protects the rights and freedoms of individuals. In this case, free speech and free press. Good evening, you're on the air. Pay your federal taxes. It's old Kurt Lochner again, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> and believe me, it is him. We have the little thing right here. So uh, now that we've heard from him, let us continue. Free speech does not mean anything other than you can exercise your right to say whatever you wish within the boundaries of your own influence or property. You also have the right to speak free speech in any public forum. Now, by public forum, we're not talking about a theater. A theater is not a public forum, it is a private property. You may enter the theater by paying a fee, purchasing a ticket. If you go to a public park and you are exercising your right, ladies and gentlemen, to free speech, and according to the first article in amendment, your right to peaceably assemble you may stand upon a soapbox and you may say whatever you wish as long as it is not seditious and as long as it is within the accepted laws of the community and in particular concerning obscenity. Now, in private, you may say whatever you wish, ladies and gentlemen, as long as you are not engaging in preaching or instigating sedition. And I urge you all to look up the definition of sedition. You may, however, use any obscenity that you wish within the privacy of your own home, your own bedroom, on your own property, where nobody else can uh, hear you or be offended by that particular obscenity or speech. Okay, on the radio, on the radio, you may exercise your right to free speech on the radio if you have a radio station or if you have contracted to purchase airtime. And within that contract, you are fulfilling the terms of the contract and are not violating any of the clauses, restrictions, are not going outside of the privileges that are granted by the contract. 
See, when you enter into a contract, you can have your rights restricted voluntarily if you understand the terms of the contract, agree to it, and sign it, ladies and gentlemen. So if that's what you want to do, I mean, you can certainly do that. But the owner of the broadcast station has absolutely no obligation whatsoever to accept your money, to give you a contract, or to allow you to broadcast on his or her radio, television, or any other broadcast medium. It is not a requirement. It is not something that he or she must ever do. And uh, that brings us to Al Wiener. You see, the only thing that Al Wiener did that anybody could possibly have any complaint with is the fact that he made the statement for several days going into the uh, broadcast, uh, um, the actual broadcasting of WBCQ, that uh, anybody could come and purchase airtime and say whatever they had to say on his station. So, and he's explained on several occasions why he has changed his mind about that. But he cannot in any way be faulted for exercising his right of ownership and taking a particular program off the air of his station. He has that right as the owner of the station. You see, when he built and put WBCQ on the air, he was exercising his right to free speech or the right of whatever consortium owns WBCQ. For that is the truth about the exercising of freedom of speech. Whoever owns the medium has the right and no one else. That's why several years ago, ladies and gentlemen, we tried to get all of you who were complaining about the media, complaining that they didn't tell the truth, that they didn't print the, the stories that should be printed, that they sensationalized, that they put spins on things and doctored stuff up and just outright printed lies. I tried to get you to invest in the stock of Gannett Corporation in order that we might own one of the largest media corporations in America. You see, they own literally most or a good chunk of the print media, the radio stations and television stations in the United States of America. They also own almost every billboard that you see on any highway all across this country. But nobody was interested. They wanted their freedom of speech, but they wanted somebody else to give them a chunk of theirs instead of exercising their own right through ownership of the press. Alan Weiner didn't do anything wrong. He did what he has a right to do. And if he were to kick me, this program, this broadcast, the hour of the time, off tomorrow and after tonight, he might do that. I don't know. I don't think he will. He has a right to do that also. And you would never hear one single complaint from me because I'm not a socialist, I'm not a collectivist, and I'm not a communist. Nobody owes me any chunk of their property or their freedoms. I am responsible for my own. That's why, ladies and gentlemen, I print my own books. That's why I print my own national newspaper. That's why I have my own radio broadcast. And if this is successful, that's why we're going to have our own television broadcast, television show. And... Uh, Anybody that tries to interfere or stop me from exercising my freedom of speech, Kurt Lochner, we will seek you out and prosecute you to the fullest extent of the law, which we know here. And we'll talk about taxes on another night. See, there's a lot of poor, misguided folks in this country who are doing something that the law does not require them to do. They are paying out extortion money to their masters 
because they are cowards. They are afraid. They don't know the law. They've never read it. They actually think that they must pay this extortion money to the mafioso called the Internal Revenue Service in order to keep from being destroyed. You see, the law does require some specific people engaged in some specific activities to file and pay the so-called income tax. Most American citizens who are citizens of the several states of the Union are not required to file or to pay. And I will prove that on this broadcast. And ladies and gentlemen, let me give you our website address. It's harvest-trust.org. If you go there, you'll find more legal documentation than you ever dreamed of finding. You'll also find the offer of a $10,000 reward that can go to anybody who can prove that the statements made when you click on that $10,000 reward are wrong. The offer is open to anyone who works for the Internal Revenue Service or the United States government or the United States Department of the Treasury or anybody else who wants to claim it. The law is simple to understand, ladies and gentlemen. The law, the supreme law of the land, is the Constitution for the United States of America. It spells out exactly what the government is, what powers were granted to the government by the people, what powers the government may exercise and how, what crimes the government may prosecute, how the government works. It protects, it enumerates and protects the rights of the states and of the citizens, and it specifically states within the Constitution for the United States of America that any powers not granted to the federal government nor prohibited by the Constitution for the United States of America rest with the states and if the states fail to exercise or claim those powers to the people. If you don't have a copy of the Constitution for the United States of America, I suggest you get one. I suggest you read it. It's very short. It is the United States of America. It outlines all of your creator-endowed rights and protects them against government, not against other people. It protects you from the government. It limits the powers of the government. It sets you free. Unless, of course, you don't read it, you don't understand what it says, you don't understand what it means, and you allow yourself to be enslaved by all of the alphabet soup guys that are in the process of stripping you of your rights, of letting the dragon known as government out of its cage to gobble up the freedom of the people and to once again enslave us all. Freedom of speech is important. Nobody, nobody must ever be silenced. Alan Weiner did not take anyone's right to freedom of speech away from them. American dissonant voices have the same right that Alan Weiner has. They can get the money together and start their own shortwave station, or they can build a commercial AM or FM station, or they can build a television station with their own money and they can exercise their own freedom of speech anywhere in this country that they want to if they have the money to do it. And that's another subject that we'll cover on another night because the government has set up restrictions that make it absolutely impossible for anyone other than the rich, the rich, to own and operate a commercial AM, FM, or television broadcasting station in this country. The expense of operating, of building and operating a shortwave station is also, in most instances, prohibitive, but can be done and has been done. WGTG, 
was built and is operated on a shoestring by a man who didn't have a whole lot of money but wanted to build it. WBCQ was built and is operated by Alan Weiner and whoever helped him do that. And you'd better hope that these stations survive. And you should ask yourself, why is it that the common man cannot any longer build and operate a radio station within his financial capabilities? Low power, 10 watts. There are plenty of open frequencies, ladies and gentlemen, and a 10-watt station on FM or AM in local areas where these frequencies are open even though they may be used by somebody in another state far away, would never interfere with any other commercial broadcasting station. You see, the purpose of those rules and regulations are to stop the common man from having a voice. People like me, people like you, people like Alan Weiner. Have you ever really listened to most of the commercial broadcasting stations in your city or town? Do you realize that very few of them ever address any of the issues or subjects that the people in the towns and communities which these stations broadcast to really want to hear or should hear? Do you realize, ladies and gentlemen, do you understand that uh, we're turning over the tape now. Do you understand? Do you really understand that the largest segment of the population has absolutely no voice whatsoever? And if you do understand it, what in the world are you going to do about it? You see, there are things that you can do about it. There are things that American dissident voices can do about it. I don't like them. I don't like their philosophy. I don't like their, we're better and superior than everybody else, and there are people who need to be exterminated and wiped off the face of the earth, and we're going to rule you with an iron hand, fisted Nazi stormtrooper stuff. I don't like that. But they have the right to say what they want within the limits of their ability to provide themselves with free speech medium. It's called low power FM broadcasting. Micro broadcasting. Actually, it doesn't have to be micro-broadcasting. If you're broadcasting with FM and you're in an area where if you are engaged in commercial broadcasting, that your broadcast does not cross any state or international boundary. You see, intrastate broadcasting is outside the powers of the federal government to license or regulate. If your state decides to license and regulate intrastate broadcasting, then you must comply with whatever they legislate for you to comply with. If your state chooses not to do that, then you have the right under the Constitution, the power falls to the people. And you being one of the people, you have a right to set up an intrastate broadcasting station and exercise your freedom of the speech. Of your speech. Of your broadcasting speech. Of your tonsillitis speech. I don't care what kind of speech. You have the right to do that. And I urge you, I urge you to exercise that right. I have been told that, Bill, if we do that, the FCC is going to come and they're going to squash us and put us in jail and all this kind of stuff. Ladies and gentlemen, if everybody across this country exercises their constitutionally protected rights, the FCC is going to allow... low-power broadcasting 
once again, as they used to do all across this country. There used to be little stations everywhere, little mom and pop stations, one watt, two watts, three watts, five watts, ten watts, twenty watts, all over the place. Until guess what happened? Somebody thought up an idea to have a national public radio network. National public radio. You would think that something like that would be to serve the public, wouldn't you? But have you ever listened to national public radio? National public radio does not serve the public. It serves a socialist agenda only. It ignores the rest of the public. It also serves an anti-Christian, anti-Islamic, anti-Muslim agenda. And that's not all. The real agenda is anti-religion, anti-freedom. To make way for national public radio, the FCC did away with all broadcasting under one watt, or excuse me, 100 watts of power. They will not license or grant any broadcasting station the ability to broadcast if you have under 100 watts of power. Unless you're like me and you decide to exercise your rights under the Constitution and you understand the restrictions placed upon government and you are not engaged in interstate or international commercial broadcasting and you have the guts to draw the line in the sand and stand for your principles and ideals, if you're like me, you will do that. And if we all do that, the dragon will have no choice but to go back in its cage of its own accord and of its own free will. A nation of cowards is a nation of slaves. That's how you get enslaved. That's how it happens. You're afraid. If I do that, I'll get on somebody's list. Oh, gee, I know I can't find any law. I've looked for years that says that I'm required to file and pay income tax. But if I don't file and pay, the IRS will come and get me. <clears throat> if every time they came to get somebody who is lawfully within the law, exercising their rights under the law, standing on their doorstep with a rifle in their hand, the FCC will stop, will stop, will stop breaking the law. And that's the truth. See, you don't have to hurt anybody. All you have to do is make it known that you know the law, that you're within the law, that you understand who the lawbreakers really are and that you are not only ready and willing but committed to defend yourself and defend your freedoms and your constitution. That's the real purpose of the militia, ladies and gentlemen. See, you don't have to hurt anybody. You don't have to threaten anybody. They're threatening you right now. Good evening. You're on the air. Oh, yes, Mr. Cooper. Uh, this is Bill from Cleveland. Hi, Bill. I, uh, let's see, I'm reading from the uh, August 9, 1998 issue of Stereo Review magazine. Uh-huh. This is a, uh, it's a magazine for hi-fi enthusiasts. Yes. I've been one since I was about 12. And this is on the uh, page uh, 6, August 1998. Okay. Uh, I'm just they really fear? They fear that if they can't compete and give the people in the community the broadcasting that they want, 
they won't get the paid advertising that they need to live and operate their station. I see. That's what they're afraid of. I see. And these broadcasters who have... That quote, the acceptance for filing of this petition for rulemaking does not imply any approval well, for that's right. power operations. That's right. But you don't need approval if you're operating intrastate. That's, that's within your sovereign state. Within your state, yes. Within the territorial boundaries of your state, and your signal does not go across the state line or an international boundary while you are engaged in commercial broadcasting. I see. I see. Okay, I just thought, this was in a magazine, you know, the magazine, I just thought I'd pass it on that you might be interested. Yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. You see, <clears throat> you know why they're accepting those petitions now? They wouldn't even consider it before. Because we have encouraged and helped to set up hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of micro-broadcasting and low-power FM stations all across this country. And just a couple of weeks ago, ladies and gentlemen, maybe three weeks ago, a federal judge ruled in Michigan involving the FCC's prosecution, should read persecution, of Reverend Strawcutter and his FM low-power broadcasting station, the federal judge threw the FCC's case out saying they have no jurisdiction over intrastate broadcasting and that everything in their brief was nothing but so much smoke and mirrors. And that's the truth. It was a brave judge who did that. But he's a right judge, an honest judge, and it's about time we found some somewhere, don't you think? Most of the criminals in this country, ladies and gentlemen, are sitting behind the bench in federal courts. They're called federal judges. I have sat in courtrooms while people were cited for contempt for just mentioning the Constitution for the United States of America. They were silenced and told never to mention that document in that court again. In this country, the United States of America, I call that treason. I call that judge a despot, a criminal. I call anybody who accepts anything like that coming from the mouth of a judge in any of our courts in this country where we are supposed to be under the rule of law, the supreme law of the land being the Constitution for the United States of America, cowards. That's what I call them. You can call them whatever you want. I call them cowards. Despicable, worm, slimy cowards. You see, ladies and gentlemen, the American people are going to get exactly what they deserve. What they deserve. If they continue if they continue to be ignorant of the law, beginning with the supreme law of the land, ignorant about their own freedoms, ignorant about the rights of the states and of the individual people, citizens with a capital C of those states, ignorant of the restrictions placed upon the federal government by the Constitution for the United States and how far outside of those restrictions that federal government has moved. Alan Weiner knows his rights. I know my rights. American dissident voices also know their rights. Do you know yours? Do you? Really? Have you read the Constitution for the United States of America? Do you even have a copy? Do you even know where you can obtain a copy? Do you? Did you feel that? Did you feel it? I reached right through the microphone, out <laughs> your speaker, and I sort of tapped you on the side of the head. Wake up. Wake up. 
Wake up. Educate yourself. Some fool who calls me and says, Find and pay your income tax. Anonymously is the coward worm that he is. Is a fool. And I say this to you, fool. You show me the law that requires me to file and pay income tax, and I will be the first one to do it as a loyal, law-abiding American citizen. And if you can't find it, and if you cannot show it to me, and you still and file and pay income tax, then you are lower than the most despicable, cowardly worm that crawls upon the face of this earth. And if you're running around whining because nobody will give you freedom of speech, <laughs> when you have it all along, and don't understand in the slightest bit how to exercise it, what it means, who has it, who doesn't, when and where it can be exercised. Then guess what? Guess what? I've got a ticket here. It says Cuba on it. Everything in Cuba is free. It's a communist country and everything belongs to everybody. I'll be happy to take you down to the pier, help you onto the boat. I'll even shed some tears when you leave and wave goodbye from the dock. And I will help you reach your dream of getting your freedom of speech supplied to you by somebody else for free. And we'll see how well and how long you exercise it and how long they let you live. <laughs> <laughs> if you even decide to try such a thing. Good night, folks. God bless each and every single one of you. We'll see you again tomorrow night. And uh, get off Al Wiener's back. He owns the press. He owns it. It's his freedom of speech, not yours. He doesn't owe you anything, and neither do I. <laughs> And the moon is the only light we'll see No, I won't be afraid Oh, I won't be afraid Just as long as you stand Stand by me Are you listening, Kurt Lochner? Listen carefully. William Jefferson Clinton, in a White House memo, named me, William Cooper, the most dangerous radio host in America. And Rush Limbaugh read that memo on his broadcast. It's the greatest compliment I've ever received. And if you were listening tonight, and if you listen every night, you will soon discover why. The President of the United States thinks I'm the most dangerous radio host in America because I understand the law. I understand freedom. I know my rights, and I'm willing to die for them. Folks, I know something you've all forgotten. If you're not ready and willing to die for freedom, you cannot have it. You cannot be free. You will not be free. Your enemies will not allow it. They will just merely threaten your life, and you will reach down and put the chains upon your own ankles. And you will march voluntarily into enslavement. That's what happens to cowards.
WBCQ. Monticello, Maine, USA. You're on the planet.